Good afternoon and a warm welcome to everyone joining our bite-sized series of seminars. Today's is on planning for the future and why it is important. I am Hemarana, a senior associate in the Serious Injury Team and your host for today. The presentation today will be from Baron Jones and Sarah Wintel in our tax, trust and estates team. Before we start the event, just a few housekeeping points. Um, just um, thank you for those who have already submitted questions. You can submit questions, ad additional, sorry, you can submit additional questions throughout the session via the Q&A function on your screen and we will answer them at the end. Please can I just ask that you include your email address and your name just in case we can't get through all the questions. And finally, we will be recording the virtual event and this will be sent out afterwards. Towards the end of the session, we will be posting a feedback link. Please can you take a few minutes out to just con confirm uh, your comments. And now over to Barry. Thank you, Hammer. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, and thank you for inviting us along today to give you a chat. And myself and Sarah are both solicitors in the Trust Tax and Estates team. Um, and I suppose the first thing to say is this is why do people want to do wills and why do people want to do powers of attorney and plan for the future? And basically the answer is really simple when you think about it. It's about peace of mind and that's what you that's what you're buying when you when you do this. Um, it's difficult to first look at as we'll come to on the next slide, but initially it's about that peace of mind. It's about choosing the people who you want to help you. And it's about choosing um, where things go and, and ultimately when you pass away who, who they pass to and limiting any disputes. So that peace of mind is really important. The other question which I think we, we all get asked straight away is should I do a will or do I need to do a will? And the answer to that is almost invariably always yes. Um, in fact, I'm struggling to think of a time when I would say no because as we'll touch upon later, even if you wanted to do a will which totally replicated the rules of intestacy, um, basically speaking, it's still worthwhile doing a will because of the administrative provisions which are put into the will, which make it easier for those who you, you, you've left to deal with your affairs to sort out. So again, it's about making life easier for them um, when, when you've passed away. So despite that answer and despite what Benjamin Franklin said about nothing is certain but death and taxes it's surprising really when you look at the start that a significant number of people actually don't do wills and we'll look in a minute as to maybe why that is um, I think what's more chilling I suppose is that to, in circumstances one in three people with children under 18 die without a will now that probably tells you that those are younger people who haven't got round to it yet, but it's somewhat frightening that they've died with minor children and haven't made the will provisions and got them in place for reasons which we'll come to later. Um, the other thing to say is if you don't have a will, the rules of intestacy apply and the rules of intestacy basically decide who deals with your estate and who gets what. And in short, if you don't have any assets, it can end up with the with the Queen. So last year, 53 million pounds actually ended up with the Queen. Um, so and I suspect that most people would have preferred that that would have gone to friends um, and, and close associates. So if I could have the next slide, please. So why don't people make a will? I think I think the first thing to say is the primary reason is obviously it reminds people of their own mortality. It's a, it's a difficult thing to get your head around to think about doing. Um, but I would encourage anyone to everyone to do it. Um, people lead really busy lives and things become more important and it's something which you put off, particularly when you've got your health. Unfortunately, though, myself and Sarah see regularly people who contact us who, who have lost that ability actually to do a will. You have to have capacity to do a will. You have to have capacity to be able to do a power of attorney, as Sarah will touch on later. And if you leave it too late, yes, there are things which can be done to help you, but basically those options are time consuming and much, much more costly than, than actually setting your arrangements in place and doing the wills and doing the powers of attorney now. So. Um, 
try and find time to do it. And I think the other thing to say is people worry about contacting solicitors. I would say we're all we're all approachable. Um, and also at Urban Mitchell in the TTE team, people ring us all the time. We will always have a, a free preliminary chat with people, point them in the right direction, uh, explain to them why in their circumstances it, it, it could be important. So please feel free to pick up the phone and ask if not myself and Sarah, but anybody in the team and with a very large team who deal with it. I think as well, it, it, it makes you confront what are quite difficult decisions. So for instance, a will is a great place to put who you want to be guardians of any minor children, um, but who do you pick? Who do you pick to be your executors and your trustees? Um, often families can be quite complex these days in that blended families and people have got together and they've children with other partners. And it's actually confronting those issues and actually discussing and deciding between yourselves maybe what's fair in your mind and, and reaching an agreement so you can put that into a will and make those those plans. So it forces you to, to, I suppose, make those difficult decisions. And what I often find when I speak to people is they've thought of step one and step two. So they've thought, well, um, I want everything to go to my partner and then maybe down to the kids, but they haven't thought beyond that. And we as lawyers sort of encourage people to do that because we're trying to do a document which lasts and stands the test of time and certainly stands a couple of life events, if I can put it that way. So thinking about disaster clauses is really tricky. Um, you should also, even if you've got a will in place, you should always review your will. Um, I choose the word review and not change. So basically, when would you review your will? We say even if nothing happens, probably every five years, it's well worthwhile you digging out the will, having a look at it, giving us a ring, we'll run through, check it's doing what you want it to do. If, um, however, somebody dies, somebody's born, you fall out with somebody, you get together with somebody, your assets go up for whatever reason, your assets go down for whatever reason. Those are really good reasons why you want to consider your will and consider your planning because you pl the will is, is very much part of the planning process for the future and what you do with tax, etc., and where you want things to go and preserving the wealth for your future generations, as Sarah will touch on. Could I have the next slide, please? I've already touched on this. So what happens if you don't do a will? It's always worthwhile thinking about, well, actually, if I don't do a will, what happens? And there's a, a few myths and I've put three on, on the screen there. Um, so basically, if you die and you haven't got a will, the rules of intestacy apply. And those rules of intestacy say who deals with your estate and who gets your estate. And in short, there's a pecking order and the pecking order tends to be spouse or civil partner, children or bloodline, parents, brothers, sisters, half brothers and sisters, grandparents, aunts and uncles and then the crown. So that there's that pecking order. So you might think, well, that, that's fine those who are listening will have noticed that when I said spouse and civil partner, I didn't say partner. So a common one is that middle question there. Well, we live together as common law husband and wife, as some people refer to it. Um, so it would all go to the other. The simple answer is it wouldn't under the rules of intestacy. The rules of intestacy make no provision for partners. So you can have a situation, for example, and to give you a, a live example where a couple have been together for 30 years, one of them passes away and uh, basically the entire estate drops down to one partner's children and that means that the other partner in effect then is in maybe a very difficult position, maybe they're residing in the house where they need to live and what that results in then is you end up in a dispute situation whereby the only option to the partner to be able to get anything from the estate short of reaching an agreement is to apply under an act called the Inheritance Provision for Family Independence Act of 75, um, which is extremely costly, extremely time consuming. Another popular um, myth for want of a better expression is that everything will go to my wife or my civil partner or my husband if I die first. Um, it's not necessarily true, unfortunately, um, in that what the rules of intestacy say is that the 
the, the spouse in this question would get the first 270,000 plus personal possessions and half of the balance would go to them and half of the balance between the children. And I, I personally have come across a case where I was dealing with a probate where a gentleman died in test uh, All the assets were in his name and when he died, unfortunately, these provisions kicked in and the wife had to sell the house in order to be able to give monies to the children under the rules of intestacy. Now, I don't for one second think that would have been in his contemplation had he thought of it. So it's a good live example of, of how the rules of intestacy don't work in certain circumstances. Another popular one which people say is, well, it, it doesn't matter because I'm not worth very much. I think anybody who's done the type of work that I've done for, for years comes across people who live very frugally, save relatively small amounts each week or each month. Uh, they actually own a house which they don't think of as an asset because they just live in it. Uh, but often those houses are worth six figures plus. Um, and also as well, they've saved up quite a bit of cash. So actually it, it's very rare somebody dies and they're literally not worth anything. And even if they're worth a small amount, it still needs sorting out. So in terms of the administration of the estate with a will, it just makes it easier for the executors to deal with the estate. We put in provisions which make it easier for the executors and the power derived from the will so they can crack on with the administration straight away. Uh, another thing which I'll just touch upon as well, and I've come across this twice in the last couple of weeks, which is um, a situation whereby what happens if a, a, a partner dies and the estate is then going to a minor child, which has happened in two matters over the last couple of weeks. Um, in that situation then, the, it was the ex-wife in both cases who then has the choice to decide who deals with the administration of the estate because under the rules of intestacy, the estate was going to the minor child and it is the, the wife in that situation who has the, the final say as to who should be the administrator of, of the estate moving forward. So for all those reasons really, you're hard pressed to see why anyone would want to rely solely on the rules of intestacy plus as well the rules can change um, so you're leaving it to chance and and what tends to happen is there tends to be a disproportionate probably amount of disputes arising out of intestacy rather than will arrangements because when you do the will you are planning and you are making arrangements and you're trying to make it fair and any solicitor worth a salt, I suppose, if you were leaving somebody out or giving disproportionate amounts would say, well, let's record why you've done that. So at least it's there. So can I have the next slide, please? So just to recap and, and pick up on some other points, the reasons to make and update your will, it overrides those intestacy rules. It gives you the peace of mind. It hopefully prevents family disputes or limits them following death. It can speed up the process because the administration's easier. This is an important point as well. People like to leave things of particularly sentimental value to certain people, jewellery to daughters, musical instruments to people. Um, so it's a really good place to put that. Sarah is going to touch upon this later. It's part of your planning, but also as well, you know, what if you don't want your children to get their hands on money at the age of 18, which under the rules of intestacy they would. Um, you might want to say that will happen at 21, 25. You might have somebody who's vulnerable. You might just not like the partner of the child uh, of your child, in which case you might want to protect your money to make sure it goes where you want it to go by utilising trusts, as Sarah will explain later. Um, guardians we've touched upon and Sarah will touch upon how you, you use you will and, and when you're planning to look at the tax situation and where possible obviously make tax efficient wills and tax efficient arrangements and one thing which I would just point out which isn't on the slide is that it's also a good place to put your wishes with regard to cremation and burial because again it's not the sort of conversation which you would have generally with people um, and at least it tells your executors what you wanted at the date that you signed your will. So what I'll do now is I'll pass over to Sarah to take you through the rest of the slides. Thank you. Hi everyone. Um, my name's Sarah Wintel. I'm a solicitor in the Tax Trust and Estate team and I work alongside Bering. And uh, part of what we do is uh, preparing wills and also lasting powers of attorney. 
so following on from what uh, Beren has spoken about, I'm going to give you a little bit of a, a whistle stop tour on the, the different types of worlds that we can put in place incorporating trust structures. Um, I could talk about this for hours, uh, so I'll try and keep it really, really concise and brief. Um, so first of all, you can uh, put in place a uh, trust structure in your will to make sure that children and grandchildren are provided for. Um, a lot of people are concerned about minor uh, children receiving quite a large substantial sum of cash at the age of 18 when they're not potentially financially savvy to, to look after that and invest it properly and, and not spend it on, a, on things that they probably shouldn't be spending it on. So trust can be put in place to cover situations where cash is withheld until they are a little bit more, a little bit older. So for instance, 21, 25, to make sure that that money is protected for them when they become a little bit older and become a little bit more financially savvy. Um, also, there are trusts that you can put in place for vulnerable beneficiaries. So this can include uh, disabled beneficiaries, for instance, where you want to make sure that money is protected for their benefits. Um, and also this can include uh, wanting to protect money from third parties, for instance. So this can include uh, beneficiaries who are going through divorce proceedings uh, and also beneficiaries who are going through insolvency or bankruptcy proceedings. And it in effect protects assets from creditors and also divorced the uh, divorced spouses. Um, this can also, you can also put in place tr trust structures to cover uh, unmarried partners. Again, as Barry mentioned, there's no such thing as a, a common law marriage. So when it comes to unmarried partners, they wouldn't be uh, benefiting under the intestacy provisions and a trust structure can be put in place to make sure that those partners are protected. But on the other hand, actually, at the end of the day, saving the majority of that cash for, say, for instance, children from previous relationships. Trust structures can also be uh, be included for uh, inheritance tax mitigation uh, to try and mitigate inheritance tax as much as possible. And this is where, again, obtaining legal advice concerning how the trusts are going to be structured is a really useful tool to make sure that you are you are distributing the majority of your assets, not to HMRC, but instead to your chosen beneficiaries. Um, Division of assets following second marriages. Uh, this can be, uh, this is uh, seen quite commonly uh, where a marriage will revoke a will previously put in place unless it's made in contemplation of marriage. And the consequence of that is potentially you are disinheriting your children from a previous relationship um, where the new spouse can prepare their own will to then redirect the majority of the family wealth to their chosen beneficiaries rather than in accordance with your wishes. And uh, mitigating care fees is also another uh, another way that you can ring fence assets uh, so that 50% of the estate, for instance, is protected for your chosen children, grandchildren, rather than making a gift at of, of everything over to the survivor of you, which would then potentially be available for any sort of uh, care assessment by uh, completed by the local authority. Uh, next slide, please. So again, I could talk about inheritance tax for hours um, and uh, just just a bit of a whistle stop tour. Um, so every single individual has an available nil rate band of three hundred and twenty five thousand pounds which is transferred to any other individual and anything in excess of that balance is taxed at 40 percent. Uh, now it's important to note that any transfers, so when somebody passes away, if they transfer all of their assets over to the surviving spouse or the surviving civil partner, the effect of that is that that transfer is free of inheritance tax, irrespective of the amount that goes over to them. Now what they've done by transferring everything over to the survivor of the spouse or civil partner, what they've done is lost the ability to transfer that 325000 to somebody else. And so on the death of the survivor, what you can do is you can have, you can utilise the available nil rate band from the first to pass away. So in effect, you've got two lots of nil rate band, which means that you've got up to 650,000, which could be transferred free of inheritance tax. Once one thing you need to look at is that figure isn't set in stone, because if there has been any lifetime gifting up until the uh, the date of death, 
then that could potentially be taken into consideration. And this, you might be aware about the seven year rule, for instance, that can come in in respect of any sort of gifting. But there are assets that can be gifted which fall outside of that seven year rule. And so that is an example of where, for instance, you gift, uh, this happens quite a bit, you gift a property that you live in to your children, for instance, and you survive a period of 20 years. Well, if you if you if you live a, a period of 20 years, that could potentially still form part of your estate because it's what we class as a gift with reservation of benefit. So if you are planning on doing anything like this, it's always really important to get legal advice concerning it so that you're fully advised on the consequences of what of, of what of what you're planning on doing. Any gifts to charity are free of inheritance tax, irrespective of the amount that goes over, provided that it is a registered charity. Uh, and if you do decide that you wish to gift quite a substantial amount to charity when you pass away, it's worth considering whether this is going to be over 10% of your estate to charity. And the reason why I say that is because if you do gift over 10% of your estate to charity, then you have in effect uh, the ability to reduce your inheritance tax liability from 40%, as I noted above, down to 36%. Um, so it's a useful tool if you are wanting to make gifts to um, gifts to charity. There are certain assets that if you hold, if you own them and you own them for a certain period of time, they could potentially qualify for inheritance tax relief, which means that they are taxed at zero percent, which basically means that they are free of inheritance tax. Uh, that can include farming assets uh, and also business interests. One thing I would say with this is it's really, really key to get legal advice concerning these assets because the unless you unless you qualify for the set criteria for that relief, you might not qualify for that relief. And it's a very, very, very useful and um, and beneficial relief. So it's always worth getting advice concerning those assets if you if you own them and if you will qualify for that additional relief. And finally, there is an additional residential nil rate band of up to 175,000 per person. Um, and this could potentially again be transferred free of inheritance tax. But again, it's really key to get legal advice about this because there are quite a lot of situations where this inheritance tax relief isn't available. If you don't own property, for instance, it's not going to be available. And if you are transferring it to, uh, for instance, nieces or nephews, if you're not transferring it to children or grandchildren, then you are not going to be uh, benefiting from that relief either. So again, it's really important to make sure that you get that additional relief um, utilised when something happens to you when you pass away. Uh, next slide, please. OK, so uh, just briefly stopping on uh, lastly, powers of attorney. Um, there are two types of power of attorney. Uh, the first one you'll probably be more aware about than the other one. Uh, the first one is the property and financial affairs power of attorney. Um, and that deals with anything from bank accounts over to pension, li liaising with pension providers, both state and private, uh, dealing with HMRC, for instance. And it also covers the uh, dealing with any sort of property, for instance, if you need to sell the property because that person who's put in place the power of attorney, they need to move into care, for instance that allows the attorney to facilitate the sale. Uh, and with property and financial affairs, lasting powers of attorney, you can have personal ones and you can also have separate business ones. This is useful where you own a business and, for instance, you do not want your family members being involved in the business because they've never been previously involved, but you would like your business associates to be involved. On the flip side, you wouldn't want your business associates being involved in your personal finances. And that's where the, the personal uh, LPA and the business LPA can come in quite um, can come in quite useful. And health and welfare LPA um, is put in place, and this allows your chosen attorneys to deal with things such as your daily routine, uh, for instance, washing, dressing, um, eating, who you come into contact with, where you live. Uh, it deals with medical care. And it also there's a specific section in the, this lastly power of attorney that deals with life sustaining treatment. Uh, now, this is where you can allow your attorney the authority to to give or refuse life sustaining treatment. It's a very, very personal, uh, personal decision. Um, and it's something that we can advise on uh, and provide you with all the pros and cons. And then it's for you to make a decision on how you would see the attorney acting on your behalf. 
the health and welfare power of attorney can only be used if you were to lose mental capacity to manage your own health and welfare because of course if you are perfectly capable you should be perfectly capable of making your own decisions concerning your health and welfare on the flip side the property and financial affairs one can be used if you lose capacity to manage your own property and financial affairs or if you um in the instance that you were to retain capacity throughout and you just need that little bit of extra help. There is an option in the power of attorney, which I'll discuss in a section, which you can change that, but there is that flexibility to have that property and financial affairs LPA uh, to allow your attorneys to use that throughout uh, should you lose capacity or not. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, making a lasting power of attorney. Um, we always recommend really doing a lasting power of attorney at the same time that you do your will. It's good lifetime planning and making sure that you are not only covering a situation during your lifetime, but you're also making sure that your assets are protected after you pass away. Uh, it can be a procedural, but it can be very procedural um, and it can be lengthy, lengthy, unfortunately, which is why we recommend doing it sooner rather than later, because it covers you in the future should you need it. Uh, there are various forms that need to be completed uh, and the attorneys need to be appointed and they can either be appointed on a joint or a joint and several basis. Now a joint basis is where you must act together uh, and a joint and several basis is where for instance one attorney can act without the approval of the other and we would be advising you on the pros and cons of each option and whichever is, is, is your chosen preference. Uh, the extent of their authority, uh, as I mentioned above with the Property and Financial Affairs LPA, there is the option to have the attorney act if you were to lose mental capacity, but also in the instance that you just needed that little bit of extra help, you're perfectly capable of managing your affairs, but you just want that bit of extra support. Um, you do have the option to restrict the attorney to only acting if you were to lose mental capacity, but again, that would be something that we'd be advising you on on the pros and cons of each option. Uh, any power of attorney for it to be put in place must have a certificate provider and that certificate provider is somebody that can confirm that the person putting in place the power of attorney is mentally capable of understanding the consequences of putting it in place. In effect, they have the mental capacity to put it in place and then that nobody is in effect pushing their arm behind their back, forcing them to do something that they don't want to do. Um, and then there is a strict order of signing and if you don't meet that strict order of signing, the power of attorney is potentially going to be rejected. It needs to be registered in order for it to be used and the Office of the Public Guardian deal with that registration process. And if the Office of the Public Guardian see that there isn't this strict order of signing that's been met, they will reject the uh, uh, lasting power of attorney and in effect, you will lose the application fee, part of the application fee, if not all of the application fee. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so again, like I mentioned before, it needs to be registered with the Office of the Public Guardian. There's an £82 registration fee per power of attorney and it can take up to 14 weeks for it to register. Um, so this is why as soon as it's been signed by the uh, person putting in place the power of attorney and all the attorneys and replacement attorneys, we would always recommend getting it registered straight away because as soon as it's been registered, it can be used straight away. Uh, especially if something were to happen to the um, uh, the donor of the power of attorney. If you don't do it and if you don't register it straight away and then you get to a point where an attorney needs to act under it, the attorneys cannot act until it's been registered. So you've got this waiting period of up to potentially 14 weeks where the attorney can't do anything, which is why we always recommend getting it registered sooner rather than later. Uh, next slide, please. And finally, so if there's no lasting power of attorney in place, uh, this is where a deputship application is needed. Now, I believe my colleagues are going to be talking about this uh, in a separate presentation, which is taking place on the 8th of March. Um, uh, but in effect, a deputship application is needed whereby a, an application is made to the Court of Protection, which deals with all capacity issues. And if a deputship application is needed, it is an extremely lengthy process and can, it can take uh, between six to nine months to complete, even if this is undisputed by other family members. And in effect, during this time period, assets are in effect frozen and you won't be able to gain access to them. And the reason why that is, is because the person who an application is being made on behalf of hasn't got the capacity to make decisions concerning their own property and financial affairs. And usually what happens in these types of situations 
situations is that you have family members having to pay out of their own personal funds for, for instance, care fees, etc., because they can't gain access to the, uh, the patient's finances themselves. Um, there are more restrictions on a deputy acting, and the reason why this is, is because the person hasn't actually chosen that person to act on their behalf. The court has decided who the most appropriate person is, and because of that, there must be more restrictions in place to make sure that the deputy is acting in the best interest of uh, the patient that they're looking after. Uh, and linked into this, there's a, a requirement for an insurance bond to be taken out. And this insurance bond is basically in place as an insurance policy to make sure that if there is any financial loss that the, uh, the person has incurred because of actions by the deputy, then this is when the insurance bond will pay out to make sure that, that there isn't any financial loss. And again, annual accounts need to be made, which isn't usually required where you've got an attorney. And again, that's because the person hasn't chosen that deputy to act on their behalf. The Court of Protection has chosen that deputy to act in their best interests. And so that's a, a, br a brief kind of summary of uh, wills and lasting powers of attorney. Now, some previous questions have been submitted um, earlier before the uh, start of the presentation. And I think Beren's going to be asking um, or answering a few of those questions. Beren? Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Sarah. Yes, um, I'll deal with the uh, a couple of questions and then pass back to Sarah. So one question is, is can you pick executors who live abroad? Uh, the answer to that simply is yes, you can. Um, what I would say is that every executor, I suppose, has a choice um, when when the worst happens to decide whether they want to do it or not. So they have a choice of whether to do it, whether to not do it or whether to take a back seat. Um, what I would say is think carefully about instructing executors who live abroad only because from although it's it's allowed and it can be done, it's the practical issues of getting things signed and forms signed, etc., which isn't beyond the wit of man, but um, it can add a layer of difficulty. Um, so just have a think about it. But the simple answer to that question is yes. Um, and then there was another question, which was how do you protect the finances of one sibling from from another? Uh, if I've understood the question correct, and please feel free to contact us afterwards so we can discuss it further. Um, basically speaking, this goes to what you put into your will. So it, it is, using an example, say there are two children. Um, what you would say in your will is probably half would go to um, one child and the other half to the other child. Um, and what often people put into a will is they say, well, if it goes to the first child, if something were to happen to them before before you, that it passes to their children and down their family line. But ultimately, it would only go to the second child if that first child died without leaving any bloodline and then goes there. So the answer to the question is, is to make sure your will is drafted properly uh, and that it reflects exactly what your wishes are. But again, the simple answer, I suppose, is to make sure that you, you, you've separated out the gifts to each child. Um, but again, if I've misinterpreted that, please feel free to ask and, and contact us separately and I'll, I'll happily go through it. And I'll just pass back to Sarah, who's who's uh, going to deal with a couple of other questions. Thanks, Baron. Um, so, yeah, I've got a um, I've got a couple of questions. Um, so the first one is um, I would like to know what kind of trust I need to set up for my two disabled sons for when I'm no longer around. Um, so, yet yeah, there is the ability for a disabled person's trust to be put in place. I briefly mentioned this when I was talking about vulnerable beneficiary trusts. Um, so where you have uh, disabled beneficiaries, one of the key things to make sure is that if you are going to benefit them uh, under your wills, you don't make an absolute gift free of trust. And the reason why you shouldn't do that is because you don't want to have any sort of means tested benefits that they're entitled to affected. You don't want to give them a large sum of money, but actually the benefit, the, the effect of that is to have a detrimental effect on their benefits. So from that perspective, I'd be recommending that a disabled person's trust is the best option to make sure that not only is their income uh, continuing in the same way 
after something happens to you. Uh, but also it means that the trust structure will be put in place to protect those beneficiaries from, for instance, any thought, any sort of third party involvement. Um, we do find where there are vulnerable beneficiaries, there is quite a high scope for uh, financial abuse uh, and people um, benefiting from uh, trying to um, manipulate people and so these trust structures are really useful mechanisms to put in place um, to make sure that those assets are protected for your chosen beneficiaries. And the second one I've got is very, very similar to the first question where it explains uh, we want to set up a trust for our young adult son who has Down syndrome but not sure where to start and can we set it up ourselves? So again, for this type of situation, I probably would again be recommending a disabled persons trust to make sure that that money is ring fenced for your, your adult son. Um, can you set it up yourself? It's really, really important to get legal advice concerning these type of trusts, because if you set it up yourself, you might find that actually you're causing more issues than good, because if you don't set up the trust correctly, you might find that there are actually negative inheritance tax consequences for setting it up because it hasn't been set up correctly. So we would always recommend where you're putting in place trusts like this, we would always recommend getting in place legal advice so that it's being drafted and prepared in the right way and you're getting the right advice for it. Um, and I think that's all the questions that I've got. Emma, is there is there any more questions? There are. Thank you, Sarah and Beryn, for, for the presentation. Um, we have got a few questions coming through and maybe Beryn, you could answer the, the next question. The question we've got is, how often should you review your will? So the answer to that is we normally recommend that if nothing changes, you, re you review your will probably every five years. But if something does change, such as, you know, somebody's born, somebody dies, uh, your assets go up or down, you remarry, you, you, you divorce, then you should obviously review your will at that point as well. Great, thank you. Um, there is another question, Baron. I don't know whether you just want to answer that too. I have two vulnerable children. How does inheritance affect them? Yeah, so again, this goes to, I suppose, what Sarah was talking about before, which is it's important to understand, I suppose, say say you have a vulnerable child who who is reliant upon state benefits, local authority provision. Um, if you leave them an outright gift, that can actually make their position worse because it could strip them of the benefits or it could strip them of that provision. So in effect, what you've done is you provided them with money, which is then paying off what this, the, the state would have paid for. So by utilizing a trust such as a disabled person's trust, or, or in, a, in a will, putting monies into a trust where it's at the trustee's discretion. The trustees can decide how, how much to release and when and do that in, a, in an efficient way and basically using that money then for the, for the benefit of the child. So it, for the, in simple terms, it can be used for the nicer things in life rather than paying for things which would have been paid for anyway. So I think that's a really important um, question and one where yeah, the use of the use the use of trust there is really important, and and don't give them an outright gift. Put it into a trust, um, so that you can control the money going to them moving forward. And if we take the last, maybe one last question, Sarah, maybe you could answer this question. How do you prevent one sibling after the will is distributed using co-exec control to access the other sibling's share, where one sibling has a disability? Yeah, of course. So it all depends on how the will has been drafted originally. So for instance, if the will provides for an absolute gift over to that sibling, so it's free of any sort of trust, then they're free to do exactly what they wish with that share. Now, if there are questions about financial abuse here, that is a completely separate topic as to any sort of control after the will is distributed. So if the will is an absolute gift, then they are free to do what they would like with that money. If that sibling then has been potentially uh, coercing the other to, to give them money, I would be questioning if that person has mental capacity to make decisions such as that, because we all make bad decisions. It doesn't necessarily mean that we've not got the capacity to do that. 
if that person doesn't have capacity, then what I would be saying is a deputyship application is needed so that there is a deputy appointed to manage their financial affairs. And then it is the deputy that is responsible for making sure that bank account balances are, are maintained. If there's any sort of financial abuse, it's the deputy's responsibility to make sure that that is um, that is stopped straight away. And then obviously that's when the, the assets are protected. If the trust, if there is a trust in the will, then that's a separate thing. So that is where you would be looking at speaking to the trustees to make sure that money is protected and ring fenced and held back to make sure that that other sibling hasn't got access to those funds. And it's the trustees that are responsible for looking after that. OK, thank you. Um, bearing in mind the time, I think um, it was probably best wrapping up now. So any, for any other questions, we will respond uh, directly uh, to the person that's uh, placed the questions to us. Uh, just a few points to, to highlight. Uh, this presentation and previous presentations are recorded and available to view at the link on, uh, on, the, on the slide in front of you. Um, please also register for the next session using the link detailed. Our next set of sessions, uh, which will be up on the next slide. Uh, so our next set of bite sized sessions in the series are as detailed on the slide. Please do bear in mind the dates and uh, register for those if you like. And finally, um, last two points. We also have an Erwin Mitchell Care Carers Forum Facebook page. The link and the details are on the slide in front of you. Please do have a look at that. Um, and the next slide will just um, set out details of other services that we offer here at Erwin Mitchell. And on that note, uh, thank you for attending today's event um, and have a good day.